Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. We're, um, we are talking, we're, we're changing gears a little bit. Let me get this in here so I have it on me. Don't let me walk off with that, Ellie. Hallelujah. Uh, you know, uh, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit this year so far and talking about the personal work of the Holy Spirit and different aspects of the Holy Ghost. But now we want to talk about today how to experience the presence of His glory. How do they, we're going to read three passages of Scripture this morning. First, Isaiah chapter 6, Exodus chapter 3, and then Acts chapter 9. Hallelujah. We thank God for the Holy Ghost. Everybody say, thank God for the Holy Ghost. Amen. Acts, uh, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died. I saw the Lord, hallelujah, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood six seraphims, hallelujah. Each had, uh, I'm sorry, stood, the, stood the, the seraphims, each had six wings. And with twain he covered his feet, with twain he did, um, covered his face, twain he did fly. In other words, each of the wings had purposes. Two of them covered the feet, two of them covered the face, two of them he flew with. And one cried to another, holy, holy Holy is the Lord of hosts. And that's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. There's three holies. There's three, th three persons of the Godhead. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. That smoke is the glory of God. It wasn't the smoke machine with the chemical in it. You know, churches have smoke machines. And, you know, and I, that's, that's fine. But I'm telling you what, I just, just assume have the glory. As a matter of fact, I'd rather have the glory showing up in my building. And I would like to be able to tell the difference between the two. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Oh, there was smoke in the church this morning. Yeah, there was a machine over on the side of the platform. How would you know if it's the glory or not? Amen. I'll tell you, listen, I grew up Pentecostal. They, listen, them old, they, they knew some things about the glory. Amen. I was in Dad Hagen meetings. I knew some things. I've had things happen in our services. Seen, seen the glory. Amen? I said it wasn't, it wasn't some little machine with a little, some little chemical in it putting out some smoke. Hello? I, I'm telling you. And I'll tell you, that, that smoke machine don't heal anybody, but the glory will. That, that smoke machine don't sell anybody free, but the glory will. Hallelujah. The glory show up. It'll do all kinds of things for people. You'll get people healed, set free, delivered by the power of God. Amen? Somebody say Amen? amen. Hallelujah. And then, um, then said I, then said Isaiah said, I said, woe is me. I'm a man, of, I'm an, I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from off of the altar. And it laid it upon my mouth and said, lo, this has touched thy lips. And thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Then I heard the Lord say, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. Now, now what was Isaiah saying when he first got into the presence of God? Woe is me. What happened after God, God's glory did a work in him? He said, Here am I. Send me. Look over now, if you will, over into, um, over into um, Ezekiel chapter 3. That's, I said over back, back to Ezekiel. Chapter 3, we'll be reading verses 1 through 11. Now, did I say Ezekiel? Exodus is what I meant. Exodus. I, said, I did say Ezekiel. I meant Exodus. That's why I knew it was backwards. I was, I was saying, I was know which direction to go, but I was saying the wrong book. Exodus chapter 3. Exodus 3, 1 through 11. Now, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back side of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Oreb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight while the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Boy, he's a cocky rascal, isn't he? Moses was cocky. All right? And he said, draw not nigh hither. 
Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the ground whereon thou, st where thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Can you imagine, here you are, Mr. All, Mr. All cocky, you're full, full of yourself. You come bouncing up to the bush that's burning, and, and the voice says, Moses, you go, here I am. <laughs> Moses has arrived. Hello, you know. And God says, I'm God. I'm the God of your fathers. I'm God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And the Lord said, I have sure, and, and then what happened? And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. All of a sudden, he got a revelation that, they you know, he wasn't, as, he wasn't as big and as bad as he thought he was. Right. Amen? Amen? God said, More, um, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land, into a land the, uh, uh, that flow, flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pezzarites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and of course the termites. Oh, that's not in there, is it? Anyway, now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come up unto me, and I have seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, and thou, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said to God, Who am I? Now, wait a second. Just a few verses before, he said, Here I am. Yep, Moses is here. <clears throat> I am Moses, former son of Pharaoh, killed the Egyptian. You know, been taking care of my father-in-law's for I'm Moses. I am the dude, man. And God shows up and reveals his glory. Moses said, who am I? All right. Next, we'll look over into, um, he, who am I that I should bring, uh, um, ooh, where to leave off at? Who am I that I should go into Pharaoh and should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Hallelujah. Look over in Acts chapter 9, verse 1 through 6. And Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, man, he didn't care. He was going to bring them all. <coughs> he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. What were they going to do when they got them to Jerusalem? They're going to kill them. And as they journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he, heard, and he said, Lord, I mean, he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. You know what he just said to him? Boy, you in a heap of trouble. That's what he told him. You in a heap of trouble. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will you have me to do? You know, Paul wrote later, he said, if you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God is raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. How do you know? Because that's what he did on this Damascus road. He called him Lord, and he obviously believed he was raised from the dead. He's talking to him. They're having a one-on-one. -on -one. Now, let me tell you, I call this the Mr. T anointing. You know, remember, how many remember Mr. T? A puny the fool. Well, what Mr., what this, this Mr. T anointing is, Paul, get saved, or you're going to hell now. That's what happened. Remember, he's persecuting the church. Jesus came to have a one-on-one -on -one talk with Saul. And the one-on-one -on -one talk goes kind of like this. You get saved, you serve me, you do what I tell you to do, or you're going to hell right now. I'm I've come to take you out. Well, I don't believe the Lord did that. Oh, that's exactly what the Lord showed up for. He was, he was breathing out slaughter, threatenings and slaughter of his people. And let, me don't, let me tell you, God does care about his people. Are you here? I said, God does care about his people. Arise, go into the city, that shall be told thee what to do. And so Paul did. We have three different encounters with the glory here. Everybody say three different encounters. We have three different type of people here. Now, first of all, we have Isaiah who, who's self-abasiated. Doesn't think he's good enough. Amen? You know, and, and when, so when he gets to the presence of God, he, oh, woe is me. I mean, I don't even deserve to be here. I shouldn't even be here. But then God's presence of God's glory comes on him, cleanses him, and what's it do? It lifts him up. See, the glory of God will take those who are cast down and downtrodden and lift them up. 
Why? God can't use your cast down and downtrodden. He's got to bring you up and establish you in his glory and his power and make you effective for his use. Glory to God. So God takes the cast down, the downtrodden, those who don't believe that they can do anything, and makes them his ministers of light. Glory to God. Why? By his glory. Hallelujah. We need more of the glory in our lives. But on the other hand, you got Moses, Mr. Cocky. You know, Mr. I got the world by the tail. I mean, I got everything under control. He shows up and what's that? He's too cocky. What? He'll try to go out and do it in the flesh. What'll happen? He'll fail. So we got all kinds of ministers out there uh, that, that are so full of themselves. How great they are. They're, they're great uh, skill here and they're great skill there. And they're great oratory ability and, and all these kind of things. And they just run along and they're doing all this stuff in the power of their flesh. And then they're, then they're out with somebody else's wife at the church. Come on now. They're ripping everybody off. Come on. They're going off writing a book in another town having a homosexual relationship with somebody. What did they do? They were doing it in the power of the flesh. So what's God got to do to the cocky? He's going to bring them down. He's not going to destroy them. But he, we, God don't need cocky preachers. Hello? I'm going to tell you something. It ain't all about you, dude. You know, we, we got, what, what, what are some of the cocky preachers start doing? They start preaching things on prosperity like, I got the higher anointing. You got to give to me to get, get blessed. That's enough to gag a maggot, and that takes a lot. Are you here? God, you don't have to give up to get blessed. You give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. There ain't, there's no biblical statement that you, there's a higher anointing. You got to give up to get blessed. That's not biblical. What's that? That's cocky. I sat in the church. And listen, I, I, there's people I love that say some things I just disagree with. I sat in a bit, me, prosperity meeting one week and people gave me $25,000 I didn't even preach. Then you should have given it back. The labor is worthy of his hire. I said the labor is worthy of his hire. Well, it's teaching them to give to that higher anointing and get blessed. Did they give to the guy at Walmart? The guy who mops floors in third shift, did he get anything out of that meeting? Did he get to give him to give a testimony that I got $25,000 put in my coat pocket while I was sitting on the back row after I came in from working all night? No, he's supposed to give to you so you can have your million, you know, $2 million house, your six-car garage, your four jets, your, your, your $25,000 guard dog, and everything else. Come on now, church. We got to get this thing right. God, God don't like the cocky. He likes boldness, but he don't like cockiness. But you know what? Boldness comes from the Lord. Remember they got together and prayed, Lord, grant unto thy servants but that we may speak thy word with boldness. Not, not, not cockiness, boldness. What's boldness? That's an anointed word. That's a word that you're not ashamed to give because it's anointed by the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. So Moses gets in there. He comes in there and the Lord says, you know, Moses. He said, here I am. God says, I'm God. Who am I? He had to be brought down. Why? God can't use cocky, but God can use those who, who, are, who are in the right place with him. So God brings up the downtrodden, God brings down the cocky, makes him vessels meet for his use, and begins to use him for his glory. Why? Because when all's said and done, God says, I am a je God's a jealous God. He will not share his glory with any man. I love Abraham. Abraham came back, and the, and, and the king was going to give him all this stuff. He said, I'll not have it said that any man made Abraham rich. He wouldn't take it. Are you here? See, we, we say, if money comes in, we don't care how it, it could be. It could be hit money. Tithe on hit money, and we'll take it because it's for the Lord's use. I'm sorry. Are you all here? We, we, let the Lord make you rich. Yeah, that's, that's $500,000 right there. I, yeah, it's blood money. If, if it was a tithe on a hit, some people get crazy about stuff. I'll take it. Use it for God. Well, really? Blood money? Are you, are you serious? So we got to get rid of this cocky mentality in the church. Now, I'm going to say, the, the cockiest bunch got to be the charismatic word of faith people. I know, I was in them. I was right there with the best of them. God wants us to be a sweet-smelling savor. Meat for the master's use. That God comes out, not us. Amen? 
Now, some people talk about how great, you know, how, how great uh, so-and-so is, how great so-and-so is. You know, I, I tell you, I love being around humble ministers who know that it's the glory of God and the power of God that put them in that place to be able to minister effectively the way they minister. Now, I don't like to hear people who are just full of arrogance and, and, and all about them. Hello? They, they call it, sometimes they'll try to call it boldness, and it's not boldness, it's just arrogance. And then the third encounter is Paul. Now, he's just full of hate and venom. You know, God can snatch the slack out of somebody full of hate and venom. And if they don't, we don't hear about them. There may have been other Damascus Road experiences. We just didn't hear about it because they went to hell. Are you, are you here? There could have been other people who were breathing out threatening just like Paul. We didn't hear about them. Because they got cooked on the road. But when Paul got into the presence of God's glory, I'm telling you, this, this is why... Folks, we don't need another cute man method to win people. Are you here? I said, we don't need another cute man method. We don't need another rock climbing wall. We don't need another logo that we don't disciple people in our church. We don't need that, you know, we drink wine in our church. We don't need, you know, we don't, we, we don't, we don't preach on sin in our church. We don't need, what we need is the glory and the authority and the fire of God manifest in our churches and in our lives when we go into the world so that when humanity comes in contact with us and comes in contact with our church, it comes in contact with the glory of God. God and the fire of God, they have their Damascus Road experience, even the hardest heart. Paul was hard. Look at his life. He was a hard man. He stood there at the stoning of Stephen, the first martyr of the church, and held the coats as a young man of the stoners. And the Bible says, and he was consenting unto his death. And a demon spirit got in him. Bitter, evil spirit got in him. He so enjoyed the death of Stephen, he took it upon himself to become one who tracked them down to make sure they got killed. Let me tell you something, folks. Four spiritual laws ain't going to win that person. The Romans roadmap ain't going to, what are you talking about? You know, everybody's got a little technique. You got the Romans roadmap. You got the four spiritual laws. You got your chick tracks, whatever. You know, you're going to have to have some glory. You're going to have to have some fire that'll break through that hardness. Amen. I love you. Well, have some fire in your love. Amen. We love you. I believe in the love of God. Just telling people that God loves them is not enough. I know that this is contrary to what you've heard, but I'm telling you about, you know, as a matter of fact, nowhere in the Bible does it tell us to go tell everybody God loves them. It's to go preach the gospel. What's the gospel? Repent. You go study Jesus' ministry and tell him what he told the, when he told the disciples what to say, he said, go tell them, repent, for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. And that was the gospel. Yes, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoso believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But, you know, just tell people, God loves you. It's not enough. Amen? I like, and I like your, I like your band. Okay, I like your shirt. He's got a shirt. God loves you. But there's more to the gospel. And this mantra in the church now that all we want to do is love people and never say anything that makes them feel uncomfortable is wrong. We have to let them come in contact with the God. Yes, you could tell them I love you, that God loves you, but you got to have some anointing behind it. You got to have some power behind it. I just said that because he's got a band that says God loves you. He's got a t-shirt that says God loves you. God loves people. Yeah, that's fine. But you've got to have some anointing. We've got to have anointing, people. We're running around with no anointing. We're running around with little cute programs. We're running around with rock climbing walls. We're running around with groups in our churches that we you know get everybody into the church in some kind of group. And we're not getting them delivered. We're not getting them set free. We're letting them stay drug addicts. We're letting them stay bound. We're letting them stay alcoholics. We're letting them keep smoking dope. We're letting them keep fornicating. We're letting them do everything they want to do and never breaking the power of the devil off of their life. Because we're not, we're not preaching with anointing. We're not preaching with fire. We're not preaching with authority. Don't want to talk about sin in the church. Jesus never talked about sin. I bet you better go read your Bible. I think Jesus gave parables about sin. 
They're cast in the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. He talked about hell. Don't want to talk about hell in church. Makes people feel bad. They're going to feel worse if they go there. Hello? You think you feel bad hearing about it? Wait till they visit. Of course, it's not a visit. It's a, long, it's a, it's a lifelong uh, retirement plan. Now, we've got, we've got to understand the power of the church has been emaciated by Satan coming in and offering substitutes for the power of God called methods. We want to have cute methods. We want to have mantras. Everybody, one church gets big because they stop preaching on sin. Everybody does it. One church gets big because all we do is give inspirational, uh, feel-good messages. You know, you may as well go out on the circuit just being a motivational speaker. I did that Facebook test the other day. Janie did it. She got, she's supposed to be a motivational speaker. I did it. I'm supposed to be an interior designer. And I read, I read the, you know, the, you know, the stuff behind, I'm like, this thing is just full of it. It's garbage. You have a great eye for detail. No, I don't. Your, your ability to match colors. I'm like, are you kidding me? Everything that said about me was exactly the opposite of me. What am I saying here? See, we, we take something, and if we don't do it right, we mis misuse it. The love of God has been misused by a lot of people, and now we say in the church, we just got to love people. We do have to love people. Our motivation in everything we do is the love of God. We love humanity. But just saying I love you is not enough. There has to be anointing that destroys yokes and removes burdens. There has to be something working in us that we can go up to people and their, their moment of despair. We've got, it. We've got words from heaven. We've got anointings from heaven. We've got the power from heaven to set them free. Just like somebody, the Apostle Paul, you know, be, you know having your, you know, your, your, some kind of cute little heart thing or whatever and give it to Paul was not enough. Now, he'll wear it afterwards. You get that? He'll wear out God loves you afterwards. But he needs something that, he needed that power of God that would destroy that hatred and that bitterness and that, that, that hardness of his heart. We can't come into churches where, where, where we just kind of sit around and look at them and go, you can stay just like you are. It's time to stop that mess. They say, now every time you look on the internet today, there's another thing out is why, why millennials hate the church and why people are leaving the church. I'll tell you why they're leaving the church. There's no power in the church anymore. Put that on Facebook. They come and they get, they get a concert that they can go get with Vince Gill. Are you here? They come and they, and they, and they get told wonderful things. They can get into motivational meetings. They come, you know, and their kids get a, a, a morality lesson. They can get that somewhere else. They don't need to come and get, they need to come and find power. They need to find yoke destroying, burden removing power that will set the captives free where the sick are made whole. We just had in our Bible study a week, a week ago, a Thursday a week ago. Uh, we got a guy that's been coming, and he, I'm telling you, his life's being turned around. Just one message two weeks ago, three weeks ago, has absolutely set him free. Has set him free. Changed his theology and doctrine and belief system. And, you know, he, he sat there, and we, we ended up with an open question and answer session in the middle of Bible study. It took 45 minutes. But somewhere the light came on. Hallelujah. Came back the next week, and he, he said he was, he was, you know, he was still struggling off and on. We, we got, but light, more light came on. And then his shoulder had been hurting him all week, hurting him all week. Actually, been hurting him for some time, apparently. And I prayed for him. He came back this week, and he was just sitting there at the end of the Bible study with his hand up. I said, I said are you raising your hand to ask? Me? I'm raising my hand. I said, okay, why, why are you raising? I'm raising my hand. He said, he, and then he went, my shoulder. I'd forgotten. He said, it hadn't had a bit of pain in it. I said, I'm telling you. We bring people into contact with God's glory, with God's power, with God's fire, with God's anointing. It breaks things in their life. It sets the captives free. Isaiah was lifted up. Moses was brought down. Paul was delivered by encounters in the glory. 
Our churches have to have the glory in manifestation. People need to be able to come in. Hello? Let me say this. Our love for people. See, God loves them. We love people. Our love for people should, the Bible says this, the love of God constrains us. Now, you could use that in just keeping us from sin, but I think it also constrains us from doing what we want to do and doing, causes us to do what he wants us to do. It constrains us to follow his plan, to follow his purpose. The motivation of love will cause us to spend time preparing so that the glory has, a, has an atmosphere to work in. So that when people are running, running their flat jaw mouths about the pastor and about what he is or isn't doing, you're telling them to shut up. You're going to mess up the glory. And people, need, people are going to come in and have needs. And all you care about is whether you're right or wrong. And there's, there's going to be people who need encounters in the glory. And you're stifling the glory by running your mouth. Hello? So shut up in Jesus' name. I love you. Amen. But you're going to stop the glory from flowing. You're going to stop. And, and then those, are, those become what I call self-fulfilling prophecies. People start talking about how nothing's happening, nothing's going on, nothing's working. And, and, and the reason is because they're running their mouth. It is a self-fulfilling prophecy. They make it happen by running their mouth. They could change that by starting saying the glory is manifest, the power is manifest, God's fire is manifest. We always anticipate the manifestation of God's glory, whatever manner he wants it to manifest in. I've been in the services, you know, and uh, hear Dad Hagen talk about the glory. Just, just reach up there and touch it, you know, the power of God fall. I'm been, and I've been in my services where I've seen the glory manifest. i actually seen it. You don't see it all the time. don't see it often, but I've seen it. The glory will come in. Sometimes it will come in and sit up over top of people's heads, just above them. Sometimes it will settle down a little bit further. Hallelujah. I said, glory to God. I said, glory to God. And when people step into it, things are changed. The powers of darkness are eradicated. And that's, we, we're word people. We believe in speaking the word, doing the word, reading the word, studying the word, being word people. Which, no, and I'm also Holy Ghost people. See, the letter, without, see, the letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. You've got to have the Holy Ghost just, just, just like you've got to have the word. The Spirit and the word agree. They'll work together. They'll bring God's power on, on the scene. It's men and women will be set free. Their lives will be transformed and changed. I'm going to tell you something. As a young person, I said, growing up Pentecostal, every Wednesday night you had to go down to the altar and pray, and all the old folk gather around you and lay hands on you. They sure did. I mean, I, had people, I, I know there's people that lay hands on me back when I was a kid in the 60s. There were old people that had, had grown up in Pentecost had been back in early Pentecost. They were, they, were, they were coming out of people who had been in Azusa Street and stuff, laying hands on you. And I'd hear them in there, oh, God, you can just young men for your glory. And you're thinking, I want to go sin, you know. They start praying. And I don't tell you what, that stuff will follow you around. It will hound you, young people. You'll be out trying to do stuff wrong, and that, you'll remember Brother Paramore on your shoulders. God, use this young man for your glory. They pray the glory down on you. I said, they pray the glory down on you. They wouldn't do it just this week. They'd do it next week. They'd shake you till you shook with the power. Are you here? One thing, one thing we don't do much anymore is spend time on the altar. Uh, glory, glory to God. Glory to God. There's something to be said of us praying over and imparting into generations to come. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Now, deposits are made in the spirit. Now, growing up as a young kid, like I said, those old, old Pentecostals would lay hands on you. They'd been around from early Pentecost, back in the beginning of the denominations. They were old. They'd been, they'd been Pentecostal for decades. They'd lay hands on you. What, what was God doing when they were laying hands on you? He was making deposits. See, you make deposits for future withdrawals. See, I didn't know. I didn't know God was putting deposits in my spiritual bank account for a future withdrawal. 
Hallelujah. And then I've, I, now, Hallelujah. Now, I've had hands laid on me by Kenneth Hagin, Ken Copeland, Lester Summerall. Hello, Ed Dufresne. Uh, people of that line, C.M. Ward, old Pentecost. And you're talking about some of these, some of these people are old Pentecost. I mean, and how many of you have ever heard of C.M. Ward? C.M. Ward used to write, uh, uh, he, he, wrote, he uh, had a program called the... Uh, a, either paper, a newsletter or a paper or a program with the symbols of God called the uh, Pentecostal Evangel. Now let me tell you how much power C.M. Ward had with the, Pente with the symbols of God. He was on TBN a number of years ago and uh, he was sitting there and he told Paul Crouch, he said, the and C.M. Ward kind of talked like this. <laughs> he said, the symbols of God must be on the pill. And Paul said, why, Brother Ward? He said, because they haven't given birth to anything in years. <laughs> so he got called to Springfield. Said, Brother Ward, we understand you got on TBN and you said that we must be on the pill because we haven't getting, given birth to anything in years. He said, Ha! <laughs> it's amazing what a man will say under the anointing. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do with him? Half the denominations would leave if you defrocked him. You know? Uh, but see, all that what? All that was for deposits for future generations. So that God can withdraw and make deposits into another generation. God's smart. He's making deposits when, my, when I'm a child and up through my life in the ministry and my, up my life as a Christian, he's making deposits because in the day when I'm older, there's going to be things withdrawn for other young people to be imparted into them. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Glory to God. They weren't by mistake. We weren't in certain places by mistake. We were there by, we were there by the orchestration of the Holy Ghost. So I stand today, not in my power, but in the power of him who brought me. And as Paul said, I come not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. God's not interested in your eloquence. He's interested in, the, he's interested in your submission. To say what he said. And I think if God was interested in, in eloquence and, and having the right kind of speaker, Paul would have gone to the Jews and Peter would have gone to the Gentiles. Peter was the least qualified of all to go to the Jews. And Paul was the most overqualified of possibilities, but really not qualified because he didn't understand them to go to the Gentiles. If we had been running it, Paul would have been preaching to the Jews. Peter would have been preaching to the Jews. Oh, Peter's great. He cuts people's ears off. He cusses. He can get right in there and rub elbows with them. He knows exactly what to do with those guys. Those heathen, he knows how to talk to them. Paul, oh, he's eloquent. He studied at the feet of Gamaliel. He's a lawyer of the law. He's a Pharisee. He knows how to argue the law with the Jews. He can get on there and go toenail to toenail with the best of them. He is, he is intelligent. Not only that, he's a freeborn Roman. Man, he has got it going on. He's the Jewish speaker. And what does God do? God sends Mr. Cut Your Ear Off and cuss to the Jews. And you know what they said about Peter and those guys? They took note of them. That they were ignorant and unlearned men. But they had been with Jesus. Hallelujah. Paul goes to places outside of his element. But God uses him mightily among the Gentiles. And rarely did he have occasion to use his Jewish, Jewish teaching and background to argue with the Gentiles. Hello. So God's glory takes one and uses them here. God takes another and uses them there. And it confounds all of the smart people as to why God did it that way. But haven't you learned now? You, don't, you can't go by the way the world does it to figure out how God wants it done. Because had the world done it, they would have never been between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have had the splitting of the Red Sea because they would have never got there. Because they would have militarily designed, well, we can't do that. That's a dangerous place to go. But God led him right there so he could demonstrate his glory. I said, God took him right there and demonstrated his glory. 
And even in their failure, when they, when they sinned with their mouth and became as grasshoppers in their own sight, for 40 years, day and night, he manifests as a pillar of fire by night to keep them warm and a cloud by day to keep them cool. There's a six, you can have up to 60 degrees uh, temperature changes in the desert between day and night. It can be 120 and then down to 60. Well, if your body's used to 120, 60 is cold. All right? So God was a pillar of fire by night to keep them warm. He was a cloud by day to keep them cool. And for 40 years, they rehearsed before their, their children, and they saw the manifest presence of God day in and day out. Day in, day, night and day, they saw God's glory. They watched God day after day after day. And when it came time to go in the next time, they shut their flat jaw mouths and went. Hello. They, they, took, they, they went across. N no. There's, there's giants over there. They had to be thinking, give me my sword. I'm cutting some giant head off today. It's going to be giant stew. I mean, we are taking them down. They are going down, baby. Amen. Right. If you woke up every day with a cloud by Oh, a pillar, uh, a cloud for your shade, and went to bed that night with a fire, a, a pillar of fire for your heat, and you saw that every day of your life. What would you think when you think about a giant? <laughs> La dee da, we got God. Hello, <coughs> Caleb gets over there. They go around and kill a bunch of Hittites, Jebusites, Sadducees, you know, termites, whatever else kind of ice they got over there. And after they've done a bunch of stuff, he comes, he comes back to Joshua and says, hey, look. Now, Moses told me 40 years ago I could have my mountain. He's 85 years old. There's giants on his mountain. He said, but let me tell you something. My strength has not waned. He said, so give me my mountain. Well, go ahead, Caleb. He runs up there. And, he, you know, we, we play king of the mountain as kids. It's a little, a little hill of dirt. You know, push everybody off, you get to be king of the mountain. He took, all, he took the giants off his mountain. He went and got his mountain at 85. Now, you, got, you don't have any 80. I've seen some 85-year-old men. They don't, they don't kill giants. They do the shuffle step. Hello? They're not going there and taking, taking. They're not on there with Andre the Giant on worldwide wrestling. Hello? You know? You flip him over on his back like that, you know. I know there's. I know how we we had high, we had uh, championship wrestling from Florida came to our high school. You used to use fundraisers with them, the fake blood and all that stuff. You know, Ric Flair, the Golden Boy. Woo! Woo! <laughs> you know. Woo! You know, go in the locker room after there's there's that fake blood all over the floor. The canvases are designed to give big time. So when they slam them on there, they give. <clears throat> You don't see 85-year-old men jumping in there beating up these steroid monsters? But Caleb could because he knew how to trust his God. And by being in his presence of his glory all those years, giants were no match for him. I said giants were no match. That, that next generation of the children of Israel, only two. From the previous generation got to go in, Joshua and Caleb, because they were the two. Now, Moses didn't get to go in because he struck the rock twice. Go back and study it. Moses would have gone in, but he struck the rock twice, and because he struck the rock twice, he was not permitted to go in. Why? Because we use so much typology in the Bible, people in our generation would could be, be going back to that, that event and then say, you know, you got to strike Jesus twice. To, you know, to get saved or whatever. But they would come up with something God could not allow that. God knows what's going to happen. He knows how people are. So you can't go in, Moses, because you struck it twice. I told you to strike it once, but you struck it the second time. So therefore, you can't go in. The two spies that came back out and said, let us go up at once, for we are well able, are the two that got to go in, 40, in that, with the next generation. Everybody else died off. Everybody else got left in the wilderness. But they got to go yet. Hallelujah. God's glory. See, we got to be in his presence. We need more than cuteness. 
We need more than great oratory. Let me tell you, I'm not a speaker. I'm just not. When I, was, when I was in college, I had to give a speech one day in, in, in sociology class, and we had to give a speech, a five-minute speech. I chose a baseball bat, had the proper use of a baseball bat. And it's not to not win it out or hit people. And it was, it was, you know, all the different positions of bunting and, you know, swings and drag bunts and all that kind of stuff. My knees shook. My voice cracked. My face turned. I could feel the blood just going. Hello? Now, you would think I've been using a baseball bat since I was knee-high to a grasshopper. I would know what. I couldn't talk in front of 12 people. Hello? But see, the glory can take somebody who can't do that and make them speak. I've, I've, I've spoken to 5,000 people before. I've been all over the world preaching. And it's not, it's not Ed Taylor. I said, it's not Ed Taylor. It's, it's God. I said, it's God. His presence, his glory, his manifestation enables me to do what I do. Not because I'm great. Hello? I still, now, when I go someplace besides with you guys, I'm always a little nervous. I have to trust God. You know, go to places you've never been before, you don't know the people, you know. You guys have been around you enough, I know how you respond. I can tell if you're enjoying it or not. I'm, I, am, I am currently ordering ejection seats. For the church, then when you, I'm gonna have a keypad up here on my on my iPad, and if you're if you're not enjoying, it, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna inject you right out of your seat. You you be like that squirrel we shot the other day. Nathan was on from Burfield, and Nathan hit him with a pellet gun, and he went ah! backwards and fell off, and he took off running. It was hilarious. I'm gonna pump you right out of your seat. Hallelujah! You love Jesus. You love God. You love the work of the ministry. We've got to be anointed to help people. Because what this is all about, this is not about you. Um, this just, it's, it's not about you. It's about the Lord. It's about the Lord's work. It's about the kingdom of God. We have to reach people. Let me say something. We as a church need to grow. Not so we can need to grow. We need to be growing because we're reaching people. Our mission is people. Not just bring them to church. Go win them and then bring them to church. Get them saved and bring them in to get discipled. I, don't, I mean, I find inviting to church, but get them saved. Bring them to church. Drag them. Now, if, if you bring them in handcuffed and, and, you know, and, they, and they claim that you brought them against their will, I'll deny that I, I told you to do that, but do that. <laughs> I'm teasing. I am teasing. Y'all did get the I am teasing part on tape, didn't you? Okay, because I'm teasing. All right. We've got to go in the highways and byways and bring them in. But we've got to come with the anointing. We've got to come with the power. We've got to come with the glory. So that when they come in contact, whatever they need, we're able to minister to their needs. We're able to deliver them from the powers of darkness. Set the captives free. Can you say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Well, we sure love you. Can I leave you all with a joke before you go home? 80-year-old woman got arrested for uh, stealing and a uh, can of peaches, actually. And she went to the judge, and the judge said, Ma'am, why did you do that? She said, Well, I was hungry. She said, Ma'am, how many peaches were in your can? She said, Six. He said, Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to sentence you to six days in jail. And her husband said, Ma'am, Your Honor, Your Honor, can I say something before you, you pass final sentence? He said, Sure, go ahead, son. I mean, uh, sir. He said, um, She also stole a can of garden peas. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole lot more peas in there than six. <laughs> Praise God. How many love Jesus? All right, stand up. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address. P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.